Father, we bow our heads in, in eagerness to receive your word. We, we bow because we are unworthy uh, to look upon your glory, but in Christ we come confidently to you that we will be received. We just want to honor you and respect you and lift you up above all things. Father, we pray for wisdom. Uh, this topic is so sensitive, especially with regards to a woman staying at home. Um, uh, today, the culture is con just completely uh, anti-homemaking uh, concept, uh, anti-homeschool um, uh, concepts. Uh, Father, as a church, we believe that we must uh, uphold the truth, whether they believe it or agree with it or not. Um, Father, we also want to teach the truth without holding back anything that's necessary. Uh, Father, I've been um, looking at some other ministries and seeing what they would say about this passage, and there's always this avoidance of the, the clear command for a woman uh, to keep the home, to, to work at home. So, Father, we pray for your protection from the world. If someone listens to this uh, tape or, or this message and is offended and seeks to destroy this ministry, we pray for your protection, uh, that we might continually teach your people your truth, that we might reveal to the world your wisdom. Father, help us as we study your word. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's take a look at Titus chapter 2. Uh, let's begin reading from verses 1. Uh, to verse uh, 15. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds, with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of, of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. You know, that last verse that we just read, last phrase, okay? Uh, last verse of speak, exhort, and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Uh, you turn on um, you know, your computer, you look up this passage, and you wonder what pastors are saying on this. Rarely will you hear, well, I haven't heard any, anyone yet, actually, uh, on, online that, that I've heard. Uh, and I'm not talking about like uh, the ones we know. Uh, I'm just kind of seeing what others are saying about this passage. And, and they will always avoid the direct command and, and try to um, um, mention this idea that a woman should stay home in, in, in terms of its pragmatic value, you know, they'll say things like, you know, your child needs you at home. Um, today, my, my, uh, my mother-in-law and my wife uh, and our four kids went to Costco and they met another Korean grandmother who said, oh yeah, well, you know, my daughter has four kids, uh, you know, uh, three girls and one son. And, 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 um, and then uh, Pauline's mom just uh, said, you know, where's the, where's the mom? And she says, well, she goes to work. And, and the immediate reply was, 
you know, you need to, uh, you know, your, your daughter should be staying home with your kids, you know, to raise them. Um, it was kind of sh shocking because in Korean, the, that grandma told Polly's mom in Korean that when they had their fourth kid, or while she was pregnant, she actually recommended abortion. You know, so you kind of see what standard they have. But, but again, the idea there was, uh, was, you know, you should stay home with your kids. And, you know, it is a good incentive that you should not leave your children alone. They need you. And if you listen to a lot of these seminars about uh, child raising, they would always say children, uh, who, the person they need most is not the father, but the, but the mother. You know, they need the mother's care. But oftentimes, you, you, you miss the real reason why, why children need to be raised. The real reason is not so much that, that they need to just stay home and be there for their kids. The real reason is raising that child unto godliness and then to give the world a gift. The, the most precious gift that a mother can give to humanity is a grown child who is righteous. Because in Genesis chapter 1, as we talked about this last week, when God made Adam and Eve, their intention, the intended purpose between a man and a wife, was to fill the earth and rule over the earth with godly inheritance. I'm sorry, godly... Not inheritance. can't think of the word. And, and, no, descendants, descendants. Okay? Their children were supposed to grow up, bear more children, fill the earth, rule over the earth, and rule in righteousness. But what happened after Eve sinned? Her first child became a what? The darkest murderer. Okay? He killed his own brother, committed false religion by sacrificing to God um, grain and, and produce, as opposed to the prescribed method of sacrifice, which was the death of an animal. He was, according to 1 John, that he was the first false teacher in the whole world. So what, is this, what, is, so what was the intended purpose of childbearing? And what is the intended purpose of a woman staying home and caring for that child? It's not just to be there for the child, it's to be there for this child so that he or she can grow unto holiness, unto light, and then be sent to the world to be that salt and light for the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, bring them into Christ through evangelism. Um, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard that in a seminar about raising children. I mean, once in a while you mention, they hear you mention that, but when it comes to the direct application of Scripture, they all stay on the pragmatic side. They, they stop short of saying, the Scripture says you must stay home. Um, I was listening to John Piper, as I told you last week, he was just going around the point, you know, and someone asked him, well, what do you think the Bible says? Does the Bible clearly state that you should stay home? He goes, well, you know, back then, you know, a mom had work to do, and, you know, back then, if it was like her, 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 you know, do, do, the domain, you know, they had a big land, today they don't have that anymore, and so it's not applicable for her to, you know, reign over the, the, the land that she has to kind of oversee while her husband is off doing something. And I was like, what in the world is he saying? He's just, kind of, he's just avoiding the issues so that he doesn't say online or in public, the scripture says a woman must take care of the home. And I understand. It's like, it's such a sensitive issue that, that you, you will get a lot of backfire. And I was tutoring this week. Uh, and once in a while, like Bible stuff just come out. You know, I don't know how... Um, I guess it's just, I like to just kind of mention it once in a while, but um, I don't even know how this came out, but uh, with this young little, oh, I remember, I asked, I, asked the, I asked the student, so what does your mom do? And she, and she says, um, she's just a, she's a stay-at-home mom. I said, well, that's great, that's great. Uh, this is not a believing family. I think they're Catholic, but I don't think they're even that, I think they're nominal. Uh, and I said, uh, oh, so what college did she go to? Doesn't she help you out with math? She says, no, my mom never went to college. She's a stay-at-home mom. I said, oh, that's great. She goes, no, it's not. And, and, she, and I said, well, I mean, that's, it's a good thing that, that she's raising you. She, and then the little girl, um, eighth grade, straight out looked at me and said, what about the dad? Why can't he stay home? And, you know, like when you visibly look at this young gal, this eighth grader, she looks like, 
she looks like a Christian. She's, I mean, I want to say she looks very, very nice looking, like innocent, like easy to teach and, you know, like morally upright, if you can just judge them from the looks. And then I realized this woman is, this little girl is wicked, <laughs> a liberal. Uh, she's embracing the philosophy of this world and thinking what's wrong with the dad staying home and the mother working. And I just blurted out, God didn't design a woman, I mean, God didn't design a man to feed that child and even bear that child. Come on. And I just kind of said in that, in that rhetoric and she just, and then we went back to solving a problem, you know. Uh, but that's the kind of world we live in where, where there's an immediate response. Why not the man? And, and there's this disregard of design. They don't even see that because a woman is designed to bear a child and to feed the child. You know, I talked to a couple about, um, about having children, and I was encouraging them, you know, when you have a baby, aside from paying the hospital bills, if you don't have insurance, it's like close to $10,000. <laughs> if you have insurance, a good one, it's manageable, like maybe 600 700 and if he's a boy, he has to get circumcised, that's another 300 <laughs> So, you know, it's manageable. And then the first year of raising that child, is, it, it's literally, you know, free. Like, unless the mom can't breastfeed, the baby lives off the mom in every way. <clears throat> um, my uh, my uh, Silas, when he was born, actually all my children, excuse me, um, None of them drank water for six, seven months. And I was shocked. I, I was like, honey, shouldn't we feed the baby water? And she said, no, the baby milk from, from the mom's uh, body contains everything, including antibodies, so that whatever the mom is immune to, the baby's also immune. I mean, this is how God designed children. And so obviously, the Lord gave a woman the ability to bear the child. And once it comes out, to take care of the child, and then to obviously raise the child. Again, but only Bible-believing believers, you know, Bible-believing churches uh, will teach this clear, clearly. Well, let's take a look. Does the scripture say that a woman must stay home? Well, we are now in verse 5 where that topic is going to come out. Now, there are seven specific commands listed in verses 4 through 5. Okay, verse 4 again, it says, So that they may, number one, uh, talking to the older woman, encourage the young, young woman to do what? Number one, to love their husband, to love their children, to be sensible, to be pure, workers at home, kind, and be submissive to your own husbands. As we uh, made it clear again uh, several weeks back, the phrase loving your husband uh, can be translated as husband lovers, okay, and children lovers. They are to be women who's known by all that they are in love with their husband. You know, call it what you want, romantically, uh, infatuation, emotionally, physically, everything. She just loves her husband, and she loves her what? Loves her children. That is to be the uh, presentation of a woman's life. Thirdly, she is to be sensible. We're going to start with that today, and do purity, and then work our way to the one where it says, be workers at home. So let's go into the sensibility here. What does it mean for a woman to be sensible? Okay. If you look at the e English Standard Version, it uses the word self-controlled. The NIV also uses that. King James Version uses the phrase to be discreet, which I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, NASB uses the word sensible. Now, anytime the English translation has several different uh, words for the same sentence, uh, you, what you need to understand is that the Greek word probably is so rich that the translators had a hard time picking and choosing exactly which one was intended. Well, let's look at what the original word uh, indicates. It, it, well, actually, let's, let's work our way backwards, okay? Uh, let's start with the English word, sensible, and then work our way back to the original Greek. Uh, why did the translators use the phrase, uh, you choose the word, the English word, sensible? Well, the word sensible means a course of action chosen in accordance with wisdom or prudence. Some of the synonyms are practical, realistic, responsible, reasonable, commonsensical, rational, logical, sound balanced, grounded, sober, pragmatic, level-headed, thoughtful. And after I read this, I was thinking, actually, that's pretty good. I think this is why they chose the word sensible. 
how many of you have ever looked up the word sensible? Raise your hand. <laughs> and we don't really use it today, but this is what the English translation says. Well, what about the Greek? Well, if you, as I explain the Greek, you realize why that word is so fitting. It, it's not referring to someone who's simply just self-controlled. The Greek word is sophronos. It's the exact same word as you see in verse um, 2 where it says, older, women, older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible. It's the same word used of pastors that they have to be sensible or sophronos. It means, according to the lexicons, marked by serious awareness of responsibility. Prudent. Strictly having a sound or healthy mind. With regards to this ability to curb desires or impulses so as to produce a measured and orderly life that's self-controlled and sensible. So now you see why the ESV and the NIV people chose the word self-controlled there. But the NASB translators thought, hey, it's more, it's more wider. It's, 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 the word sensible covers more in terms of the lexical definition. It has to do with the mind but the mind controlling the body to do what it wants to do, as opposed to the body doing what it wants to do. Okay, you see the distinction there. And I think we all kind of understand what that's like when our mind can't control our body. We are, most of us, okay, usually, we tend toward being moved by our senses. You know, when we feel happy, we think happy thoughts. Uh, when we listen to upbeat music, we suddenly feel upbeat again. You know, was when you know when these guys want to exercise. I, I remember my uncle telling me he he, he, he just he's a, he, he used to be a boxer. He would exercise every day. Now he's getting old and he just doesn't want to. So he forces himself to go to the gym. And when he sees the younger buff guys working out, he says he just naturally wants to work hard. He's being motivated by external things. The word so phronos is. The other way, the mind controlling the body. The picture is of a young woman, or it, it's, it's neutral really, for men and women, for someone who is in their mind clear-headed, thinking in, in a biblical manner, and allowing that thinking to present itself outwardly. So a young woman is to be one who is sensible. Now, let me just kind of back up just for a minute here. None of us are sensible. Okay? We were all born with this insensibility, if you want to use that word. Turn with me to Proverbs 22, verse 15. Proverbs 22, verse 15. And, you know, when you have children, you're going to look at your child and think, wow, what a great child. My baby is so smart. My baby is so godly. You know, so self-controlled. And then you read this phrase, you read this verse and you realize, ah, it's not true. Um, in Proverbs 22, verse 15, it says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. We were all children. And this scripture says, when the child is born because of sin, the foolishness is wound up in him. It's tight. It's like it wraps himself around the child. And the only thing that's going to release that from this child is pain. The rod. Um... Now, think of a woman who grows up not properly disciplined. She is, is a grown woman with folly, okay, with, with foolishness. She's not sensible. Um, men too. Okay, we have grown men walking around with spiritual diapers. They, just, they are just so immature. Why? They, they are walking fools. Uh, whether they've been disciplined in their past or not, in the right, whatever way, uh, what you're seeing today is this foolishness just, just, just tightly wound into their, 
into the fabric of their minds that they can't separate foolish thoughts with discerning and wise thoughts. You know, you got guys play eight hours of video games straight. That, that's, not, that's not good. That's folly in its presentation. Because rationally, according to Ephesians, and biblically according to Ephesians um, 5, where it says, do not waste time. You've just wasted eight hours of doing absolutely nothing for the glory of God. Women the same way. You see women participating in this thing and that and thinking about this and that. What you're seeing is insensibility in every single person. And, and the only thing when they're young, well, that window of opportunity of releasing that child from that bondage to folly is now gone. There are grown men and women. And I'm sure the ladies in Crete that Paul was addressing in Titus chapter 2. You know, in Titus 2, when you go back, it talks about them being gluttons, lazy, selfish. Um, uh, Cretans are liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And he says this testimony is true in Titus 1 verse 12. I mean, that's the kind of women that they had at their church as well. And Paul commands them, now that you are saved and the curse of sin is broken, you must portray sensibility uh, in your life. And I guess you can say this, if you want to be sensible, just go back and do all the things that are listed here. Love your husband, that's sensible. Love your children, that's sensible. Be kind, be submissive, be a worker at home. Those are all, you can say, applications of sensibility. Now, keep in mind, folly or foolishness in the, in the book of Proverbs is portrayed as being parallel to sinfulness, wickedness. There's nothing good about being foolish. Uh, you see these movies portraying folly. You know, I think there's like, and you watch YouTube videos and they're just goofing off and laughing and, and you watch this and you see folly being presented as something um, humorous. You got to understand, in God's eyes, folly is considered sin. Wisdom is considered righteousness. It's no wonder why the book of Proverbs has 31 chapters devoted to teaching wisdom. You can say one for each day of the month. You know, I know one pastor said he, 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 tell, he tells everyone to read one chapter of Proverbs every single, every single day. You'll cover it in one month and just do it over again and again until you grow in your wisdom. The sound advice. Wisdom is for all who are righteous and God-fearing and being sensible. One who is so phronos is someone who portrays himself to be wise because his mind is sobered up. He's no longer drunken with the pleasures of this world. And ultimately, the soundness of our mind will, will translate into the soundness of our behavior. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. There's no way a non-Christian can ever be found sensible. And this, I think, will be a good warning to anyone from marrying an unbeliever. There's no capability of an unbeliever responding in a sensible manner. See, Marriage, you know, some people will say there's always problems in marriage, which is true. But there is hope because if two believers come together united in marriage, because of this passage, there is hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depth of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so. The thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to Him. 
or and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Okay. So can a woman be this type of a person who, who has the mind of God? If she's saved, yes. Now she needs to grow. As, as, as I stated earlier today in our introduction or in, in, during the announcements, um, the, the, the illustration that I heard MacArthur say was just so amazing that when a baby is born, it's born with everything necessary for life. The baby just needs to mature and grow and exercise his faculties. In the same sense, MacArthur was saying that a spiritual child is born with everything necessary for spiritual living. The faculties must be exercised. That's why there must be discipline, there must be practice, there must be humility, and we have the grace of God through our stumblings and our failures. Women today in this world are portraying uh, someone who's headstrong, um, self-loving, idealistic, proud, hungry for power and glory, women who are abusive, Women who are lazy, selfish, emotionally driven, unsubmissive, uh, hungry for power, hungry for, for acknowledgement, basically not so phronos or not sensible. What kind of a woman does the Lord um, see as one who pleases Him? It's someone who is a lover of husbands, lover of their children, and one who is what? Sensible. You know, um, you know, it's something you should say to your spouse once in a while. You know, honey, be sensible. And yes, the husband should say to the husband, I mean, the wife should say to the husband too, that is not sensible. Okay, so Fronas, honey, did you forget the, 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 the message from Friday? You need to think correctly about these issues. And so both the husband and the wife must constantly encourage each other to think according to the mind of God. And ultimately, that's what it is. Someone who's so thrown us is someone who is God-like in their thinking. They think according to the way the Holy Spirit within them is seeking to lead them in their thoughts. Let's go to the next one, Titus chapter 2. Purity. Purity. Okay. A woman who is to be sound in their faith is someone who is pure. Verse 5, to be sensible, and then it says pure. Uh, the Greek word is hagnos. Uh, the translations uh, are pretty consistent except for King James Version. Uh, it says the word chaste. Um, and I think because the translators at that time, the King James translators, they, you know, they got together, they looked at this word purity, which is hagnos, which is more, it's obviously referring to other things too, but because of its context of being a wife, and because of someone who is now no longer to be attractive to other men, uh, they want to use the word chaste as referring to uh, fidelity. Uh, I think it means more than just fidelity. Okay? Um, what exactly did Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, intend? I think you can make the argument that it does refer to a woman's fidelity as well. But if you look at the word itself, it it's so deep that it goes beyond just marital faithfulness. I, I don't think uh, that just by being faithful that she is, that, 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 that this is what the word is teaching. The lexical definition of hagnos means someone who is guiltless, someone who is unmixed in their motive, someone who is sincere. Freiburg says it's referring to persons who are characterized by moral purity as someone being without intent to do wrong in a manner. Actions that are characterized by right motives. I believe that this word goes beyond just fidelity. It's referring to a young wife who is so inwardly pure and innocent, without guile, without mixed intentions. She is inwardly pure. 
Yeah, and that, I think, application-wise, refers to fidelity as well. She's not going to sexually be attracted to other, other men. She is pure in her heart. When her husband looks at her, he, he, he knows, he, he can trust that her heart is pure. It's without ulterior motives. Um, again, going back to Proverbs 31, where it says that the heart of her husband trusts in her because he sees the purity of her heart. He, his, there's no doubt as to what she says and what she's thinking. Uh, the NAC, the EBC, uh, all say that this is referring to marital fidelity. Okay. Um, MacArthur, in his commentary, says refers primarily to mortal, uh, mortal, mor moral purity, but in the context here, to sexual purity and marital faithfulness. And yes, again, yeah, we can make that we can make that argument that in this context, because she's a wife, she must be pure. But it's a, it's the same thing for husbands. You have to be pure, so it's a given. If you're married, you must be pure. So I don't think the push is so much you should be married. To, uh, you should be faithful in your marriage. The idea here is young ladies learn to be pure in your heart. Be a pure person, which leads to marital faithfulness, which also leads to every other thing. You know, your loving your husband is made in a, is done in a pure way. Loving your children is done in a pure way. Uh, loving people, being a woman of virtue and godliness. You are someone who is pure. You, you can't see a stain of the world in their life. Purity is something attained and must be preserved. You know, you ask, well, how do I start? How do I become pure? Well, salvation is where it all begins. You are cleansed. Okay? You are cleansed by, by God, His forgiveness and His blood. But purity must be cultivated and preserved by protecting your heart, your mind. You know where it says, above all else, guard your what? Guard your heart. <laughs> do, do I need to clarify that that does not mean guard your heart from being romantically infatuated with the boy? You know, I know some people use that to tell young ladies, don't fall for him. Above all else, guard your heart. <laughs> the word heart in the and the Hebrew always refers to the mind. It's saying, guard your mind from filth, from wrong thinking, from garbage doctrine. As a woman, if you desire to be pure, number one, you must be saved. You must be forgiven and, and regenerate. And then that pure heart that's been made pure by God must be kept pure by seeking after that which is good. Practically, um, you need to really watch out what you see, what you read. Um, Dan, Pastor Dan Na and his wife Mina, uh, we talked to them for a little bit before uh, our marriage. And uh, I remember him um, sharing with me that, or her sharing with me that, uh, you know, my husband doesn't let me watch this TV show. And it sounded so condescending. You know, I, even just from a believer to a believer, like, would like he doesn't let you watch that and and he and he said as she said because he wants to guard my heart you know that he's preventing me from watching something that will taint the purity of my, my heart and i think as husbands yeah you should do that protect your wife but more than that wives i think you should just be sensible and know what to not watch and what to you know gaze upon and listen to now, if you want to know if you're really being pure, you know, because you might be thinking, well, how do I know I've become pure? Well, it's a bit subjective in the sense that you can look inside your heart and ask yourself, am I intentionally seeking a life that wants to bring glory to God and Him alone? And the answer, will, is, and the answer should be yes, but now the next question is, can we objectively see this? And I can answer that in two ways. There's two biblical criteria to check if a woman is actually pure. One, her tongue and what she says, her speech, and two, her attire. 
How do I know that? Well, I'm not making this up. Turn with me to 1 Peter 3. And say first, we'll look at 1 Peter 3 first, and then we'll look at 1 Timothy 2. But look at 1 Peter 3. Notice the connection of purity with regards to her, her speech. In verse 1 it says, In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that if any one of them or any of them are disobedient to the word, uh, to the word they may be won without a what? A word. So she has a control over her tongue. The implication is, I think, obvious. She sees what her husband is doing wrong and she wants to say something. This might imply that either these husbands are just straight out disobedient to God's word in terms of being an immature believer or they're living with unbelieving husbands. Whatever the case, the wife is tempted to nag and to point out and try to win him over with her mouth, with her speech, with her words. But Peter, Peter reminds them, you need to be pure in your heart towards your husband by restraining that tongue from speaking. Look at verse 2. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. And notice he goes right into the clothing. Your adornment must not merely be external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. And I think we can clearly see that the implication is she's pure inside. Purity of a woman is revealed in two ways. Think about it in this context. Her speech or her restraint of her speech, her ability to control her tongue, and her ability to put her emphasis not on her clothing and how she dresses. Turn with me to 1 Timothy 2, and again, the same two come up again. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands. Now, you guys just, just stop there just for a moment and, and recognize that there's a distinction between a male and female right now. Now, this is referring to a church service. In the church service, I want holy men who are not, you know, in wrath, who are not in dissensions with other people, these are the men, holy, godly men. You want to use the word pure? Fine. Pure men. These are the men who are able to lift up their hands and pray in front of people on their behalf for the people to God. And suddenly, so it switches to women in verse 9. And I will say that the idea of holiness is carried through implicitly here by saying, okay, women, if you are holy then you are not to speak in the church and teach. Your holiness or your purity is to be demonstrated through submission, through the holding of your, of your speech and the clothing that you wear. Verse 9, Likewise, see? Likewise. If men are to bring the, the, worship, of, the uh, worship of God in the church by praying um, corporately for the people, Women can join in that worship, a pure worship to God by adorning themselves with proper what? Clothing. Now notice it doesn't say don't wear anything or just wear whatever. Paul says they must learn to adorn themselves properly. So he's, it is that the emphasis here is that she, she works hard at trying to clothe herself in a modest and discreet manner. You can't braid your hair with gold, pearls, or costly what? Garments. And again, we understand the, uh, tr the, uh, the culture that he's referring to at that time. There was no middle class. It was just upper class, filthy rich to poor. 
And when a woman came into the service, he's basically referring to these rich women. And how dare you come into service to worship God with that clothing? He's basically telling them, think before you come into church with that clothing so that you don't offend maybe other women, cause them jealousy, or cause the gaze of other men. Basically, you must be modest, discreet, that only God will look upon you. And your attempt, your eagerness to dress properly is the worship of God. It is an indication that a woman is pure. Now, I'm not making this up, right? It's pretty clear that it doesn't tell men to dress modestly or discreetly. Okay? Now, I, get, I think today we, started, we need to start saying that. <laughs> Some guys, they just want to present too much of whatever muscle that they've been feeding with protein or too much chest, whatever, and now everyone, all these young guys are looking too pretty. Maybe we need to start, you know, but generally speaking, it's the women who are by nature in their beauty of their form, I guess, in their bod bodily form, God wants them to be presentable in a modest manner. Verse 10, rather by means of good works, as is proper for a woman, making a claim to what? Godliness. Someone who is reverential toward God, who is pure. So, verse 11, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Again, referring to speech. So, I do not allow, verse 12, a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. So notice that the purity, the purity aspect for a woman is revealed by what she, by how she controls her tongue and what she wears. So for young ladies, you know, in your heart, if you truly, truly de uh, desire to be pure before the Lord, practically speaking, gauge what you say and what you talk about and gauge it based on what you wear. And I think in one sense, you do need to have some other godly woman giving advice and critique of what you desire to put, you know, put on. I remember C.J. Mahaney, um, I, I think this is something that their ministry had some struggle with, where they were teaching this modesty issue to such an extent that it kind of, again, the, it backfired on them, uh, where one of, some of the ladies... I don't know the exact story, but I remember his uh, interview with so-and-so saying that, yeah, so someone approached my wife and, and they thought she was being immodest. She was wearing a, like a form-fitting shirt that was solid. And they told her that's too much. <laughs> and they had to go through all this discussion and, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, I, I, I don't want to push it that far that we have to be like, judgmental with what women wear. Uh, this is where I think women need to, you know, mature up and figure out what to wear that's appropriate, you know, uh, and be gracious. Now, I don't think we can, you know, ha we should have like a, like a church constitution that says uh, these are the only things that a woman can wear. And again, if we do that, we have to do that for men too. We, so, but this is, the, the principle here is if a woman is pure, it will reveal itself in the kind of clothing she wants to what, you know, put on. And I guess conversely, if a woman does present herself in some manner that's overt, you cannot deny that it's because of your heart. You know, when people say things like, don't judge me by what I wear, what the scripture makes it clear, we can. You should. You know, that what you wear reveals the maturity of your what? You know, of your, of your, of your heart. For the woman. Now, I think, guys, there's some application there, I, I would say. Uh, like, uh, uh, you know, I, I do think, you know, your young brothers should come to church dressed appropriately. You know, not in the kind of clothes that they will wear to a beach, beach party or whatnot. But, you know, without sounding like an you know, overly strict... Um, kind of a person where you have to kind of you have to wear a tie or not wear a tie or whatnot. Uh, I, I do think that an appropriate attire for an appropriate occasion reveals 
you know, the mind and the heart with regards to uh, his maturity. But again, this is referring to women. Now, for women again, this is, we're focusing on women right now because the text is focusing on uh, the wife, the young wife. Um, how do you begin this path toward purity of the heart? Well, turn with me to Romans 12.1, and this will definitely apply to men too. Men, if you want to be pure, this is where it all begins. It's, it's not so much, you know, throw all your garments away. Okay, you don't want to start there. But you do need to wear something. Okay, uh, it's not. You don't want to work your way from outside in. You want to work inside out. And, and this is the path toward purity. Um, it begins with a devoted heart to the Lord. Look at verse one. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. If you want to f- summarize that first verse, it would be a wholly devoted heart, a wholehearted devotion. You want to just give your whole body to the Lord and sacrifice it and burn it at the altar that it might be pleasing to Him. You want to give Him your ears, your eyes, your heart, your brain, your mind, your senses, everything, your foot, your hand, anywhere you go, anywhere, anything that you hold on to. For women in this context, if you want to be pure and be according, you know, and, and live out the, the things mentioned in Titus 2, it begins with a complete, unhindered, sacrificial devotion to God. And until you get to that point, nothing will change. And this applies to guys as well. It's not so much, okay, let me, let me reorganize my life. Let me check my schedule. Let's cut this out. Okay, I'm not going to watch this particular show. I'm not going to do this particular activity. I'm going to trim this and that. Everybody's about trimming things. You don't do that because until you get to the root of the issue, nothing will change. What I'm basically saying is this, if you want to become pure, according to verse 1, you have to first just commit completely and be willing to just get rid of everything. Release everything intentionally. You know, do I have to give that activity up? Golf? I mean, it's, it's a form of exercise. I, I, I think it's good. Look, you want to do verse 1, it says present your bodies. Present your whole body. Put it there and kill it. You know, like Abraham, who was going to slaughter his son Isaac and sacrifice him. Put yourself there and just get ready to put that knife into your heart and say, Lord, I'll die today. Take me. I give you everything. Meaning, you have to be willing in your heart to just surrender everything. You start there with that attitude. And then... And then when the spirit and your heart is joined, in terms of its agreement, then you can figure out what particular activity you're going to hold on to and what to get rid of. See, a lot of guys, a lot of gals start backwards. They're like, okay, I guess that part, I need to cut that out. It's kind of hindering my time. Okay, that thing, but I'm just going to keep this one and this one, this one, because it's beneficial. My phone, I need my phone, or this, that, and, you know, you just got to start from point zero with just giving everything what? Up. Or else verse one doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't say, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present that one thing. <laughs> that thing. It says present yourself. Like if you ever struggle with legalism, this whole like, well, that's legalistic. You know, it's not about giving things up. You know, no, 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 whatever. It's because you don't understand verse 1. You're not taking it literally that you are to give your whole, 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 your whole self to God on that altar as an acceptable sacrifice to God, which is, a, which is your spiritual service of what? Worship. Now, how do I know that, that that's what it means? Well, if you go to chapter 14. Okay. Again, the same phrase comes out. Verse 18. Okay? For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to what? 
God and approved by men. What, what is he referring to? It says, verse 17, The kingdom of God is not eating, drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, I know and I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Meaning, if what you decide to take, that beer, that drink, that particular activity, if that causes a younger brother to sin, be willing to give it up. If you do that, verse 18, in this way, okay, if you serve in this way, okay, you're serving Christ and that service is acceptable to what? God. Okay? So verse 19, so we pursue the things not which pleases us. We pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. See, in the church, there should be, I think, some sense, sensitivity to t about talking about your hobbies, like what you like to do. Because that neutral activity that's beneficial to you might be an offense to someone else. That's why it says in verse 22, The faith which you have, have as your own conviction. Okay, Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he actually what? approves the idea here that we're trying to point out is that the path toward purity becomes a, a path of complete self-denial we're not saying by cutting things off you're becoming more holier it's the attitude of complete surrender and in this sense if it's a piece of meat or food or drink or whatever it is that you like but you're willing to give that up because you've already given it up. See, in chapter 12, verse 1, it begins, right? Chapters 1 through 11 is doctrinal, and then there's the practice part. He begins the application of all the 11 chapters of doctrine by saying, you begin, therefore, by complete surrender of your whole self, your whole self to God. And then in chapter 14, if someone has anything that's offense, that they're offended by because of what you approve of, be willing to give that one. Be willing to give that up. But then it's no problem because we've begun with the attitude of self, complete self what? Surrender. Um, I, I can, you know, I'm so tempted to just launch off into this, uh, this hiatus, but uh, I'll restrain myself. But I remember growing up and from like my high school years up to my end of my college, this, this was like about six years of just constantly hearing people talk about Christian liberty. I don't hear too much of it today, it seems, but over and over, there was a constant discussion, what can we do as Christians? What's a gray area? What's this thing? What's sinful? What's not? And I was thinking, wait a minute, something's not right. Something's not right because they kept emphasizing it's not wrong, it's not wrong. And eventually churches became uh, places where it's okay to smoke, it's okay, it's okay to go to clubs. And then eventually churches start to meet in clubs, nightclubs for their service. I don't know if you've heard of that. Like, it's not wrong. Like, this is a place where it promotes infidelity, drunkenness, carousing, sin. And then you're going to pay your rent to the bar owner so that you can have a church service. Like, it's okay. It's gone so far because the, the push for this agenda was not let's protect Christian liberty. I mean, the agenda was let's protect ourselves and our desires. There was no talk of Let's be self-sacrificial when even though these things are okay. And by the way, what's our view on this? Our view is that there's no middle ground. There's no white, gray, and black. Look at chapter 14. It says, verse 14, chapter 14, 14. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in what? Itself. Okay? Nothing is unclean in itself. Meaning, the food that's been sacrificed to an altar, is that unclean? No. In itself is not. The wine that they used at the temple, 
in, of Diana to commit all these orgies and drunkenness and carousing, is that wine sinful? Is that a gray area? No. In itself, it's not. Everything is clean. It's the person who thinks it is unclean. To his conscience, it is what? Unclean. Um... There's no gray area. It's just, it's white and light, or it's dark. Okay, so we know what darkness is. It's just complete, you know, uh, indulgement of the senses and sin, immorality, those kind of stuff. With regards to these things, everything is clean. But in those clean things that you can possibly partake in, whatever it might be, even smoking, um, you don't begin by asking, what are my rights as a Christian? I think that's like the dumbest thing. That's like stupid. I'll say it again. That is so dumb. You don't begin by asking, what are my rights? When you came to Christ, you had to give up your what? Your rights. When you called Him Lord, you, you basically said, you have the right to do whatever you want with my what? My life. Where it means... Next morning I wake up and I have a tumor coming out of my neck and ready to die. Thank you, Lord, for you have the right to do that to what? Me. I wake up the next day, I'm healthy as an ox or as a horse. Okay? That's God's prerogative. Shall we accept only good and not ill as, you know, as, as Lamentations would say in chapter 3? When we became a believer, we gave up our what? Our rights. So the path toward purity is in conjunction with that sort of attitude. A complete abandonment of the self in chapter 12, verse 1. And then, what do you do? When do you, you not only just give your body, but now you have to fill your what? Mind with His Word. Verse 2, do not be conformed, uh, by, uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You can um, outline this in three ways. Number one, it says actively reject the world. When it says do not be conformed, it's a, it's a, um, it's a command. The word conform. It's in the passive tense. This is a really interesting parsing for this Greek. It's, it's a present, passive imperative. Present meaning right now, continually. Passive meaning it's being done to you. And the command is, don't let that happen. And the idea here is that Paul is saying is, as a, as a human being, there's no such thing as static equilibrium. You don't reach an equilibrium state where you're not pushed, you're just balanced. Every single day, there's going to be a conforming pressure of the world to make you like the world. You've all felt it on the freeways, in traffic. When some guy cuts you off, or they're honking at you, because you're going too slow, or you went too fast, or you, you came in the lane too slow or too fast. I mean, when people honk at you, and you, you just feel this you know, you're upset. And then when someone does that to you, you feel like you have the right to do the same what? Same thing. And you are, you are already feeling the conforming pressures of this life. And Paul is saying, actively, don't sit there passively, let this happen. As a believer, you must actively reject it. And then two, the second principle in verse two is passively let the Spirit change you. The phrase, be transformed, it's a command, and it's also passive. What that means is, He's commanding you to yield and let the Spirit change you. And He's going to change you. How? Number three, by the renewing of your mind. And that's the third principle, actively pursue the truth. So, actively reject the pressure Passively yield to the Spirit, and then actively pursue the truth. This, I would say, would be a perfect way to say that the application here would be, turn on John MacArthur every single time you're sitting in the car. 
Okay? Or any sermon, mine or someone else, just not the bad guys. Okay? Radio shows. Some of you guys love listening to news article radio shows. Some of them are profane. Stop listening. I mean, okay, fine. Once in a while, that's fine. Okay? That's Christian liberty. But if you're serious about wanting to have your mind conform to the image of God, I would say every waking moment you can, fill your ears with good things. If it's music, good music, with good words. And once in a while, Tim Hawkins. You know, good, clean, Christian fun. Okay? But some of these guys kind of go too far, though. You have to be careful. The point is, you got to reject the world Pass, be passive to the Spirit of God and then to pursue uh, the truth. Now again, just as we step back here, we're trying to talk about the path toward purity. If a woman wants to seek purity, where does it begin? Well, we talked about clothing and we talked about the tongue. Those two things are the result of purity. Okay, Those two things are the result of purity. Did that turn off? So, don't, don't try to change the clothing first. It's change the heart first, and then you look at your clothes and ask yourself, what can I wear, not wear? But it begins by, by a complete devotion of your heart okay, to the Lord. And for brothers, it's, there's no difference. What I just said here applies to both men and women. I would say to you, um, every morning, should be a time where you apply Romans 1. The moment you wake up, no matter how tired or groggy you are, you get on your knees and say, God, I devote myself to you now. Spirit of God, take me. Do whatever you want. I'm going to yield myself. I'm going to give myself to you. You start your day Romans 12, 1. And then you continue by guarding your heart, guarding your minds, guarding your thoughts, reading the scripture, listening to sermons, growing and memorizing verses so that you might continue to grow in that purity. And that pure heart for women here, according to scripture, will reveal itself with a woman who knows how to control her tongue and a woman who knows how to properly present herself outwardly. Now, we're out of time. The next one was going to be workers at home. I guess I can just say that's what it means. Okay? Oi kurgos, a worker, a uh, house work. Now, I'll, let me just end with this insight. And get, it will be a, like, a, uh, like a curiosity for next week. The King James Version, amazingly, uses a different text. The two Greek words, okay? The NSB that the NSB uses, the Alexandrian text, and the, the Byzantine text, the majority except uh, the Texas Receptus, the two words are off by one Greek letter. <laughs> and it means slightly two different things. Uh, the King James Version translates this as keepers of the home. Uh, the ESV translates this as working at home. NIV translates this as to be busy at home, and ESV, NASB, and the NIV all use the same text type. The King James Version is the only one that uses the Byzantine text, and this is where one letter, okay, oi kurgos, okay, um, you, you, can you hear the G sound, oi kurgos? The King James word is oi kros, there's no G there, or the gamma sound. And there's a slight difference, and I'll go into what that means and, you know, with regards to what the implication is. Because sometimes people will say that the woman must stay at home, period. Like she can't leave. This is her domain. This is lock her in. That's biblical. Okay? And you'll see that that's not actually what it's what, saying just by that one letter. Okay? So we'll look at that next week. But this, I would say, is one of the most controversial topics and I'm not going to hold back. We're going to, as a church, just believe what the scripture says. Okay? And, and, and see what the Bible says about this particular uh, issue. Uh, and then we'll also talk about, is it a sin for a woman to work? No. Is it a sin for 
you know, for a woman to do some other things, we'll, we'll, we'll manage all of those questions uh, as best as we can. Uh, Martha Peace, uh, in her chapter on, on, on this passage here, would straight out say um, that if a woman is too involved in church and she's not at the home, she's sinning. And then she gave another illustration of this other woman who's just lazy at home. She's also what? Sinning. And then she brings up another uh, uh, example where I was like, well, I never thought about that. She says, if a woman goes to work, she might be endorsing her husband's laziness, and that's also a sin. <laughs> that he feels like because she's making some amount of money, he doesn't have to work as hard. Now, I didn't think about it that way, but there's a lot of perspectives on this. We'll try to deal with those as much as we can, but we're going to look at the text next week and see exactly what it means. Let's pray. Father, we covered a very uh, important topic today. One, with regards to being sensible. Uh, we pray that you will help our sisters in our church to grow and become women whose minds and their hearts are in control of the Holy Spirit. They're sensible. They, they know how to think and they know how to act. And they are, their behavior is guided by wisdom. And we pray for women also, Lord, who are um, pure. This world is so impure. Uh, and many women, uh, not excluding men, men also need purity. But in this context, Father, it's referring to women and the purity of their hearts. It includes marital faithfulness and fidelity. But it goes beyond that. That she is to be, she is faithful because uh, she is untainted within. Father, growing up in this society, whether we're men or women, we've seen too much stuff. We've heard too many things. We've thought dirty things. Father, um, we have the mind of Christ. We want to grow. Help us to apply the two clear, instructive commands on, on the path toward purity. And may that purity be revealed in the church through the woman's uh, ability to control her tongue uh, and her uh, appropriate attire as she chooses the, the right piece of clothing because of the purity of her heart. Oh, Father, we pray that amongst the men that there too would be purity, that we would not gaze upon things that are of this world, that we would learn to gaze our eyes upon the beauty of Christ and be in love with our Lord and our Master. Oh, Father, help us to apply these things in the right way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.